U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents Deciding the Future with special guests Sharon Booth, a young Franklin County, Kansas dairy producer, and James Buchel, state representative from the state of Kansas. Here now for U.S. Farm Report is Ellis Kitchen. I'm a member of the National Farmers Organization from Osage County, Kansas. I have with me today Ms. Sharon Booth from Franklin County and Mr. James Bukley from representative from the 42nd district in Kansas. Uh, Sharon, how is the dairy business down in your part of the country? Well, um, it's been a little better for the grade A men, I believe, since the holding action. But uh, the milk I'm selling has dropped a nickel since then. It could be a whole lot better. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim, uh, you've had considerable experience with uh, corporate farming laws and uh, legislative matters pertaining to farming. Uh, and uh, I believe you also had a bill introduced uh, last session. Would you uh, tell me about that a little bit? I think, Ellis, that to, so that everyone will understand exactly the involvement that we have had in the Kansas legislature concerning corporate farming, I maybe first should give a background as to what has happened in the Kansas legislature. The 1967 legislature uh, in the Senate passed a bill which would permit, permit corporate farming on a very large scale in the state of Kansas. This awoke many organizations, uh, farm organizations, and many farmers themselves became very much concerned about this type of legislation in Kansas and whether or not it was in the best interest of agriculture so far as public policy is concerned. A very concentrated effort was begun to see that this measure did not pass in the House of Representatives and as a matter of fact it was stopped so far as the 1967 legislature is concerned. The bill was carried over and again an attempt was made to uh, generate some enthusiasm for the measure but it was killed in the 1968 legislature after our governor, Robert Docking, had announced publicly that he intended to veto the bill if it were passed. Many people then became concerned and, uh, due to the information and the facts that were brought out while this expanded corporate farming bill was being discussed. In order to keep discussion alive, uh, I introduced a bill. It was House Bill Number 2008. The intention was to give people something new to think about, and that being that maybe we should eliminate corporations from agriculture. The bill, very simple in its language, provided that all corporations who derive less than 25% of their income from agriculture are prohibited from owning land which is suitable for agriculture purposes in the state of Kansas. It provided for a 10-year period in which they could sell the land. We further provided that in the event that a corporation became an owner of uh, agricultural real estate, uh, such as an insurance company on a mortgage foreclosure or a bank, that they were allowed five years in which to dispose of this land. It is my feeling and the feeling of many Kansans, I believe, that though we do not have uh, corporate farming on a large scale, ownership of our agricultural land is slowly drifting into the hands of large corporations. And through the back door, we in effect have corporate farming in Kansas. Uh, we were, you mentioned Governor Dawkins' uh, stand on the corporate farming bill, Jim. We were real happy that he chose our convention last year to announce his stand on our 1967 convention. I believe that uh, Sharon, you mentioned something about the lower price of milk. Uh, how does other farm products, such as hogs, uh, fit into the picture? Uh, well, uh, 
right now they're they're not bringing what they should be. The modernized parity for hogs should be 24.85. Uh, do you have any information on uh, the, what producers are getting in other parts of the world? Uh, yes, in uh, West Germany, hogs are bringing 29.95. In uh, Australia, they're bringing 28.51. In the Philippines, they're bringing 28.22. In Italy, they're bringing 26.93. In France, they're bringing 26.60. In Sweden, they're bringing 26.01. In Japan, they're bringing $25. In Spain, they're bringing $25. In Austria, they're bringing 24.59. In the United Kingdom, they're bringing 21.97. In Canada, they're bringing 1965. Well, and uh, this has been an average from 1960 to 1966. That's uh, very good information. Uh, of course, the farmers today know the prices they're receiving for hogs. And the uh, Agriculture Department figures a modernized parity. Can you tell me what that is? Uh, 24.85. Well, that's a long ways from the price that the farmers are receiving in this area. However, Kansas is noted for its wheat and production of wheat. Uh, what about the world prices of wheat to the producers? How do they compare with our price? <laughs> well, um, about the same really as hogs. In Finland, they're bringing $5.10. In Switzerland, it's four thirty-three. Norway is four fifteen. Japan is five is three eighty. Spain is 317. Sweden is 302. India is 283. Italy is 267. France is 246. Turkey is 242. New Zealand is 202. Mexico is $1.99. United Kingdom is $1.91. Australia is $1.74, Argentina is $1.52, Canada is $1.38, and the United States is $1.25. That's the support prices uh, to the producer. Now, our market price here runs around the dollar eighteen to twenty, I believe, today's market. So they, uh, put those figures are real important to the farmers. Uh, one question enters my mind there is how can we price ourselves out of the market? when uh, we're at the bottom of the totem pole on these various products. This uh, seems to me to kind of hinge back to some of the things Mr. Buckley mentioned a while ago. Uh, Jim, how does uh, corporate farming structures uh, affect the communities and the uh, churches and the schools and things like this in the community? Well, Ellis, of course, this is the, the heart of the reason that I and, and many other people who are interested in our in maintaining our small communities in Kansas one of the reasons that we have become concerned about corporate farming and what it means I think that the economists will back uh, back anyone up with the statement that the family farm and by family farm I define as a, a unit of which a man his family and no more than two hired men can earn a a satisfactory living and operate the farm without additional manpower. That the family farm is the most efe efficient unit of production which we have in the United States. And the concern is that as our lands drift into the holdings of large corporations are being run by hired managers and being worked by men who punch a time clock, that the productivity will decline to such a point that uh, in a short number of years when we must maximize our agricultural production that we're going to find our agricultural land in the hands of people who aren't really farmers and and aren't willing to make the sacrifices and do the things that are necessary to be an efficient farmer and it's this decline of productivity which affects the small agricultural communities a study was authorized by the United First excuse me, the 79th Congress to study the family farm and its relationship to free enterprise and its influences upon community life and the democratic institutions. 
the study was conducted by a man by the name of Goldsmith in the San Joaquin Valley in California. And he reached several conclusions uh, in this study, which are generally support what I have said. But he made three uh, uh, particular findings, and I would like to, to read them uh, so that, that everyone will, will know what they are. The first one was that the small farm, well, first I must explain that they compared two communities. One, a small farm, locally owned and operated farm, as compared to another community in the same valley in which large corporations owned the farmland and the people who worked uh, in these particular farms, the farm managers and the hired labor, uh, were paid by the corporation. In other words, they had no investment on their part in the in the operation of the farm other than, than their job. The first uh, conclusion that he made was that the community in which was supported by small farms, that there were 62 separate business establishments. And in the large farm community, there were 35 business uh, establishments, a ratio of almost two to one. And these two communities were uh, equal in almost every respect so far as, as they could make them. The second finding is that the volume of retail trade in the small farm community during a 12-month period was almost $5 million, as against about $2.5 million in the large farm community. The retail trade then was, was greater by almost 61%. The third observation that, that they made was that the expenditure for household supplies and building equipment was over three times as great in the small farm community as it was in the large farm community. And this study uh, and the conclusions that were drawn are part of the reason that many of us are concerned because, as you know, Kansas has, is not a metropolitan uh, state. We do have four large counties, but other than this, our, uh, our state is composed of many small farm communities. And it appears to me that, that with these conclusions, and as evident as they are, that the decline in retail trade and business activity in these communities would be uh, much greater with corporation farming than the individual private enterprise farming which we now have. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to put you on a spot with a question. Jim also is a lawyer here in town as well as his representative uh, districts. Uh, how does corporate structures affect the tax base, Jim? Uh, do they pay as much taxes as we as individuals do? Well, uh, this is a, a difficult question to answer. Uh, one of the major reasons that corporation farming has been advocated is that it, it, uh, the statement has been made that there is a tax savings. Uh, my information that I have been able to learn is that there is no tax savings from the corporation structure until we are talking about a net profit of $30,000 a year. Now, if uh, you are a farmer that nets more than $30,000 a year, then there might be some benefit in the corporate tax structure. Other than this, I can find no uh, tax advantage for the corporation uh, uh, farm. Now, uh, the uh, uh, advocates of corporation farming also point out the that the corporate uh, structure will allow the children to inherit and pass on the farm farms much easier than uh, uh, under an individual ownership. But I would submit that by careful estate planning, by an estate planner experienced somewhat in farm manners and, and understanding the problems, that uh, an individual farmer can pass his farm on in a unit to his children and see that it continues to operate as an effective unit. So to my estimation that the average farmer and has no benefit from, from the corporate structure, that the only people who would benefit are the persons who have large and extensive holdings, which uh, uh, gets them into to tax trouble at the present time. But I think that that the number of farmers in this country who are making more than $30,000 a year are few and far between, and that anyone who uh, sells the small $10,000 and $12,000 a year farmer 
that the corporation is going to save him taxes is, is misleading. Thank you, Jim. Uh, let's uh, go a little farther on that. Don't some individuals benefit by having a farm loss uh, where they're involved in other businesses that uh, have a loss on the farm to offset other losses? Well, of course, uh, all business losses are deductible uh, so long as the loss is directly related to the business. By investing money in a corporation which uh, can lose money uh, and yet own cattle or livestock or even real estate to a certain extent, which appreciates in value but is not taxable until the time the, the gain is realized, can actually benefit by uh, sustaining an, a loss on the farm for several years and then at the end of this period when they sell their cattle or land or whatever it is that the corporation owns, then they can realize the income uh, at 50% uh, of the normal tax that they would pay by using the capital gains. What does um, history show us uh, that has uh, happened to uh, a country where the uh, land is gathered together in uh, large chunks? Well, I think that, that history uh, uh, is important, and that I'd like to get to that in a minute. The first thing I think that we should realize is that the present form of agriculture that we have in this country is the greatest form of agriculture in the world. And this is, is easily supported by the figures on our productivity, upon the man hours that we take to, to produce farm products. So I think that we should start out by saying I know of, of no form or type of agriculture that is better than what we have. And I think then we try to analyze why it is better. We look at the countries that have allowed large segments of land to be operated as, as a unit and on an uh, employee basis rather than an owner-operator basis, such as Russia, South America. Uh, I think that the history of, of England is, is very interesting when the people became apathetic and complacent, concerned uh, uh, more about their own problems, which were not the problems of the farm in which they were working. So the uh, countries which have allowed their agriculture to be operated in large units have certainly not been successful. And I think that the, su the success story of American agriculture is significant enough that some people should be somewhat concerned about the overall agricultural policy and the and where we're going in this country before they get too excited about corporation farming. Uh, Sharon, would you say that uh, the farmer's income uh, had an effect on the community and on the business people in that community? Yeah. Uh, they, one, every dollar that a farmer spends by the time it goes to the nation makes it seven. We had a recent study by K-State uh, professors on that that uh, affected wheat. What was that? Uh, the gross farm income for Kansas in 1965 was $1,048.7 billion through the income multiplier. This farm income generated almost $6 billion of economy activity in the state. K-State economists estimated the Kansas farm income multiplier for 1965 at 3.98, an all-time high. This is almost triple the estimated non-farm income multiplier of 1.34. Jim, what direct effect would you say that that had on uh, the businessman in town and the uh, man that worked for wages, say, in a factory or something like that? Well, this is, of course, uh, another of my concerns. I am not a legislator that has a large uh, part of of rural uh, Shawnee County in, in his legislative district. I only have two townships, approximately 10% uh, of the total population in my district. But being raised on a farm and, and having a degree in agriculture, uh, uh, I am concerned because Topeka, in its particular location, uh, is surrounded by a very fertile valley, I mean, Call River Valley. We are dependent on on many of the small communities around who come to Topeka to, to uh, shop and, and buy things that they use on their farm. In my particular district, if, if the farmer doesn't prosper, he makes 
doesn't buy a new car. He doesn't buy tires as soon as he can. And so the, my constituent who works at Goodyear, or my constituent that works for the railroad, uh, is hurt. And uh, it hurts the big cities as well as the small cities when, especially in the type of economy which we have in Kansas, when agriculture doesn't prosper. I talked to a businessman last night in a small community, and he made the remark that a poor crop year in his community, or compared with a good crop, would make 50% in the difference of his business that he did that year. Do you think that's fairly general in that comparison? I don't think that the impact uh, of a bad crop is felt as hard in Topeka or Wichita or any of our large Kansas cities as much as it is directly in the small community. However, we do feel it, and it is significant. Then you would agree that uh, the figures that Sharon used uh, showing that the uh, wheat dollar out in our rural district in western Kansas uh, generated $4 within the state and uh, caused that much business to be done in the state as uh, suggested by the Kansas State University. I think that the, the, I think that the figures are accurate. Uh, Sharon, uh, on uh, business as a whole, do you have any information showing what percent of parity that the business uh, segment of our economy is uh, failing to receive because of the underpayment to agriculture? Um, it's uh, the shortage of the national income in 67 was 100 and $10.5 billion, which is 83% of parity. What effect uh, did that have on the corporations and uh, their profit? Well, the uh, shortage of, the, of corporate profits before taxes was $38 billion, which is 68% of parity. They uh, were hurt in direct relationship then uh, your figures show as uh, the farmers who failed to receive a fair price in the first place was. Would that be the conclusion that you draw? Yes, it would. And uh, where did you get those figures? Uh, it was from the 1968 Economy Report of Congress and the U.S. Department of Congress for data in regard, regard to the gross debt expansion. Jim, out in your rural area, in uh, Cowley County and um, their hometown area. Are the farmers very happy with the price they're getting today? Well, no, they're not. Uh, the price of wheat, of course, is, uh, is uh, as low as it has been for several years. And the uh, general agricultural economy has, uh, as you well know probably better than I as a lawyer, uh, the general farm economy uh, uh, prices are being down, and yet the the uh, cost of items that they have to buy uh, being up. And that I believe that, from my observation, is that times are as hard on the farm as they've ever been. Well, you mentioned wheat. Then uh, you, as a consumer here in town, uh, is your bread price uh, lower in relative to the price of wheat? No, it's not. And. Uh, uh, Matter of fact, that it is higher as not only bread but milk and meat and and most of the items that that we buy, that we have experienced a substantial increase in in price over the last few years. This uh, law that was passed in 1922 by our own Senator Capper, Senator Capper being from Kansas, uh, Jim, are you familiar with the Capper Volstead Act? just generally. Does it uh, give uh, a solution to the farm problem? Well, I don't know whether that it is a complete solution in its present form. However, I think that it has recognized one of the basic principles of which can be the salvation of American agriculture, and that is collective bargaining. Collective bargaining has uh, brought the labor people and the labor movement out of the dark ages and has not only uh, given the, to them the, or get the ability to organize, has not only given them the, the uh, standard of living uh, higher than what they wanted, but now I think that they can be classed as middle-class citizens. 
and I feel that the the basic tools are there and with some modification that the Capra Volstad Act and the principle that, that was being aimed at could be used very effectively by farmers. Our Senator Capper found uh, this uh, out some 40 some years ago and come to the conclusion that farmers needed a uh, law to enable them to do this, to group their production together and sell it as a group for a price. That uh, law wasn't used for some 40 years. It laid on the books. Uh, Mr. Uh, Volstead, also of Illinois, was co-author of that. Uh, how do you account for the fact that they didn't use this law for such a long time after it was written? I think, uh, um, not being completely familiar with, uh, with the bill and, and American agriculture, but I think probably the, probably the main reason was is that no particular farm organization uh, believed enough in collective bargaining to want to try to use it. And uh, therefore, uh, aside from all the other constitutional issues that have been raised and so forth, I feel that, that it is until recently that, that an organization of a substantial nature has decided to, to use the Capra Volstad Act as it was originally intended to be used. And that organization is the National Farmers Organization? Yes, it is. Uh, Sharon, in summary, uh, what would you say? Uh, I'd say that yes, the National Farmers Organization is the only organization that will and can help the farmer. Jim, what would you say in summary of our uh, discussion here? Well, just in summary, uh, uh, I would like to say that my first contact with the Nars National Farmers Organization came uh, during the legislative session when we were embroiled in the corporation farming matter. I feel that the position that they have taken on this issue is the correct one and the, and the position will, I think, in time bear out regardless of which way it goes. If we continue to incorporate and allow our lands to be bought up by large corporations, I think it will be borne out as right. Uh, when one of these days we are going to start wondering how we can get our farmland back into the hands of an individual entrepreneur. If they are successful and prevent further incorporation of farming, I think that in a few years, as soon as the, uh, we can get some of our problems solved that we now have in agriculture, that being mainly one of distribution of our farm products, that they're going to also be borne out as that they were right as agriculture as ahead of it, probably the most prosperous period of, of history in this country. Thank you, Jim. U.S. Farm Report has featured Deciding the Future with Sharon Booth, a young Franklin County, Kansas dairy producer, and James Buchel, state representative from the state of Kansas. Doing the questioning for U.S. Farm Report was Alice Kitchen. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers.